the way that we interact with technology, um, the way that we interact with the world is going to cross this Rubicon. Where we're not going to go back to handsets. And the way to get ahead, I think, is to start thinking about what types of products, ideas, solutions we should build now before it launches. How's your day going so far? Is it pretty productive? You know, it is. I think there's a bunch of silver linings to this whole pandemic thing. Um, so obviously there's a lot of hardship that's gone into it for people I know, but I kind of like the uh, the break in the routines. I think that any like adequate person can take a difficult situation and find the positive in it. Well said. Well said. Because it's hard to talk about like how great it's been <laughs> to spend time with your family more and yeah yeah and it, it kind of you see the most interesting parts of humanity when you have those types of hardships right this is where you get the innovation and um i think we're, we're seeing a little bit of it at mutual mobile too and so it's fun to kind of witness how people turn a difficult situation into opportunity right and yeah. it grows you like the difficult situations just dealing with them as individuals so you get to see the people like i got to see the people on my team grow through through this because it's like life demanded more out of them to get through this tough spot totally now are you letting your people work work from home or how, how's that going yeah so we're we used to all be in this office here mm -hmm. and uh then when it happened everybody went home and we just, you know, adjusted our processes a little bit. It wasn't a big deal for us. I mean, we're under 15 people, uh, but the roles are pretty clearly defined and set up well for remote work. And everyone is just really good at what they do. And just, we didn't skip a beat and we transitioned remotely. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. What about you? Um, yeah, we're doing really well with the remote work thing. I mean, what was, what was fascinating uh, just kind of through our discovery into the pandemic is you start to realize that these buildings, these offices, these institutions that existed, they weren't really about the thing of, of why they were created, right? We used to think that offices were where were, were people went to go to work, right? You went to work at your office, that's where productivity got done. Well, it turned out that wasn't the case, right? Then you think about schools, kids went there for learning, um, when in reality, building wasn't where the learning happened. You can do it fine remotely. In fact, you have access to additional course material and professors and teachers that you might not have otherwise. Same thing with churches, right? Church is a building. That's where people went to worship and to pray. Turns out you can do that remotely too. And so what's fascinating is it turned that whole um, kind of ideology on its head that we needed a building, that we needed a space for a certain type of activity to occur. And in Mutual Mobile, what we found is our people are more productive when, when they're able to work remotely. I mean, if you think about engineering and design, that's something that, yes, there is a team element to it, and it's important to have people from your craft that you get to interact with and that you get to share ideas with. In reality, though, when you're producing, when you're the ones that are creating, more often than not, in that office environment, you're going to have distractions, you're going to have interruptions, and it's going to reflect in the work. And so we've seen um, you know, very, very high positives from it. The one downside is you don't get that same social camaraderie, but there's other ways to address that. Um, I was hoping selfishly that VR was going to be the way that, that that occurred. Like if there was ever a moment for virtual reality, it was this pandemic, right? And and sadly we haven't seen that yet. I have some theories why, which we can we can get into later and when we will see that. But uh, I was hoping this would be the the VR moment. Me too. Have you seen the booth thing that they have? Which one? It's like it it's like a, it looks like a telephone booth, right? But it's it costs like sixty thousand dollars. They're they're talking about using it for artists, so they could put one of these booths on stage and they could stream. Oh, I have seen that the telepresence thing. Yeah, yeah, that is wild. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the company now. I, I talked to the founder, but I think if you if you extrapolate where that's at today, and you imagine where it's going to be five years from now, people aren't even going to go to concerts. We're just going to turn that on. You know, it's going to be quite quite impressive. I look forward to when it's like a room, like you'll have an office at your house, right? And that room will maybe be akin to like a green screen style room. And you might be able to like see your coworkers. And I don't know. I don't know what it'll be like, but. One of the ideas that we've been toying with at Mutual Mobile, because as a part of an R&D effort, is if you think about why so much business travel happened, most of the time it was for a pretty quick meeting, right? You'd fly from... I don't know, New York to Los Angeles, four and a half hour flight, 
you'd have a meeting with investors or with a customer or with someone you were interested in hiring, and then you'd head back. And yeah, it was great to get that handshake and that that lunch or that dinner in. But in reality, most of the cost, most of the time was in transit. So what if instead of an airport or a seaport, you had what we're calling a photon port? And the way the photon port would be, it would be half technology and, and, and half theater, right? So you'd go down to your some location in your city, there'd be these amazing booths or um, basically telepresence solutions set up. Everybody would have an I- identical setup. So there'd be a table, there would be um, screens, and, and it would be arranged in a way that you would have the same experience as them a thousand miles away. You'd be connected through something like the HoloLens or through some type of uh, other AR, har- AR headset, and then you'd be able to have that experience. It wouldn't be as good, of course, as the real thing. I wish we could be together today in person. It would be close, though. It'd be a hell of a lot cheaper. I love the photon port idea. I've never thought of that where there's like a place you would go to have this meeting. And what if that'd be so cool if you could actually like transmit the exact photons like quantumly or something to the person. Because one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is there's this certain energy that exists when you're in person having a conversation. Like I can have more conversations in person and back-to-back meetings than I can in back-to-back Zooms because I can feed off of people's energy in a different way. And when whoever figures that out, like how to get that aspect to transfer over long distances, I think they're going to win. I agree. I mean, that's always been the challenge with communication is that you almost have this this thermal intensity of communication, right? So the kind of the coldest form of communication might be something like, uh, I don't know, back in the day, sending a fax, right? It's super impersonal. You don't really get any type of interpersonal feedback without a long, long delay. You start warming it up a little bit. Maybe you go from a fax to um, a written letter or to an email. Email is like right in the middle. It's neutral. It's not really cold. It's not really hot. You start increasing the warmth a little bit more. You get to text message or a phone call. And that's the problem is that we don't really have anything uh, in an intermediary setting between a phone call really or or a a FaceTime call, what we're doing right now, and that in-person interaction. Things like a photon port, things like what what Apple's going to be releasing soon with their their headset, um, which we can talk about a little bit later, have a bit of special insight there. Um, That's going to potentially bridge that, I think, that connection between where we're at now and the whole meeting in the flesh thing. I like you. You like different types of technology. You seem very creative. When did you realize that you were really interested in technology and that you had this ability to to create and think outside the box? I love the question. And and hopefully I'm going to try to tone it down on being too interested in technology. I think one of my faults and one of the faults of just people who are excited about technology is we see it as the answer to everything, right? It's really easy to almost develop a fetish for, for new types of to, new technology. But in reality, it's not about the tech, unfortunately. It's about kind of the business outcomes that can be produced. And so quickly, when I started kind of falling in love with computers and, and the internet growing up, I was that you know that kid who was five or six years old and literally you know trying to put floppy disks in anything that I could. I, I, I you started to realize that you know by itself technology is is not that special. It's, it's fun. It's interesting. You really need to combine it with a true business outcome. And that's, that's one of the things before we started Mutual Mobile, we had my, myself and my co-founders had done things in tech and we realized that you don't get the leverage unless you attach it to a real problem. Um, you know, starting Mutual Mobile, one of the first things that we did is we wanted to kind of get that gimmicky thing that out of our systems that tech can do. So back when Steve Jobs announced the iPhone in 2007, um, we knew we wanted to do a company around mobile. Um, 2008, it ships, right? 2009, the app store goes live. And so we we said, look, we want to have one of the first apps in the app store, no matter what. And uh, so we made this super gimmicky app just to get it out of our systems. It was called Hangtime. Do you ever happen to hear of Hangtime? In my research for this episode, yeah. (laughs) Okay, well, you probably heard about that. Um, I'll, I'll just give the real quick um, you know, summary of that because I think it'll provide a good segue to, to, to where we used, how we used to think about technology and how we think about it today. Uh, hang time for those of, who, those, those of you listeners who aren't familiar was this super gimmicky app. I'm not going to defend it, but it was one of the first 50 apps in the app store. And the premise was 
using the accelerometer and the phone, you could, you could take your iPhone and you could, you could toss it up in the air and record how long it was in a free fall state. And so that throw that I just did was maybe a tenth of a second at most, but using the accelerometer, you could do longer and longer throws and record those. We sold this app for 99 cents. The only reason that we got people downloading it and buying it, again, Mutual Mobile's first app today, we have literally thousands of apps in the app store. But the only reason it got downloaded it was it was early. And people wanted to show off their new phone that they purchased. And, and sure enough, people started downloading it and they'd bring it home. And they'd show their friends and their neighbors of them jeopardizing this new piece of tech that they had just purchased, right? Um, so what ends up happening is, before we know it, everybody has it. We have a leaderboard. That's the one novel thing that we did with this with this application. And the scores started to rise. So people went to the top of their apartment complex. They, they wrapped it in bubble wrap. They chunked it off the building. And the scores started to hit the four or five second mark, which is really, really high, right? And uh, before you knew it, that that was kind of the thing. They leveled out there. We said that was fun. Let's go start that real company that's not focused on the gimmicky side of technology, but focused on how we can solve real business problems, how we can have outcomes. Um, didn't even think about hang time for a long time. Happened to check the scoreboard a month or two later, and we see the score out there for like 19.6 seconds. We figured out that somebody must have broken it or hacked it, and we didn't want the very first part, piece of software that we released as having this bug, right? We wanted to, to start on a good slate. So we contacted the guy. We said, hey, do you mind telling us how you broke our app, how you tricked it. And um, you know, he was almost offended by that comment. And he says, look, no, 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 I didn't break your app. I took it skydiving. And uh, <laughs> you know, sure enough, as soon as we learned that information, more and more people started jumping out of planes with it. And, uh, it, and it became uh, somewhat of a cult following. Apple finds out about it. They ban it from the store because they didn't want anyone to die over it, which makes sense. And um, it's also how we won our first award ever as a company, I think Gizmodo ranked it the second dumbest iPhone app of all time. So it's not, not nice. an award we have up on our shelf, but uh, was, was kind of how we got our start as a company in, in technology. We realized, well, this is what we did on our own, but what if we had taken that whole know-how and applied it to a real problem, something that was high stakes? And, and, and we started looking at healthcare, realized that if you add in healthcare, and obviously today during the pandemic, um, that's a bigger focus than anything. How can you use technology to create leveraged outcomes? And we started doing that back in 2009 when we started the company and um, scaled it up to 300 people that way. We're doing it again. When the pandemic broke, when the news of it first broke in Wuhan, we had no idea it was going to come over to the United States, but our team decided it would be interesting to start doing hackathons uh, to figure out how we could leverage technology to to mitigate some of the the just the hardship that was going to occur from that. So we made some of the first contact tracing applications and nonprofits associated with that effort, some that are still used today. And so we're really proud about when we think of technology and we're interested in it. And yes, I get so excited about the, the new things that are coming out, but where my mind goes and where our people's minds go is more how can we leverage that to a real meaningful outcome as opposed to something that's a bit of a gimmick and, and fun to geek out on. So you had some con. What what else came out of the hackathon? Like, what was some of the different things that came out? Yeah. Um, so so one of the things that just were some news that just broke. Um, one of the the companies that we helped start called Safe Return. Um, one of our co-founders was involved in it. Mutual Mobile built the first technology allows uh, basically companies to open up again, open up their physical spaces. My company, probably your company, it's not imperative that we're back in the office. We can do what we do relatively well remotely. There's some organizations where it's just impossible. You're not going to be able to open a grocery store remotely. You're not going to be able to open a hospital remotely. There's these mission critical places that need to get people back to work. So we created a suite of solutions that effectively allows people to self-diagnose and say, hey, I might, you know, might have might have had COVID-19. And it uses the GPS tracking to notify those people automatically. Similarly, if a company wants to roll out testing and they want to do it on a cadence of you know, daily or weekly or whatever, that application will fit into their ERP and allow them to start bringing people back to work, not in a fail-safe way, but in a much safer way than if they didn't do anything. And so really happy to announce that company just uh, just got close to $10 million round um, from 50 states. So, and that was something that was literally seven months old and it came out of that that effort. And it's already being used by a good good chunk of the Fortune 100 that have to open. 
Yeah, that's really useful, right? Because they have they need some sort of guidelines in order to do that. And I was just thinking about HEB. They're like this large grocery chain in Texas. And I had talked to them a few months ago and they had some really cool innovative tech people. So it's like maybe HEB could use that. Totally. I, I don't know if you knew this or not, but HEB is one of Mutual Mobile's customers. So we built their their suite of shopping solutions. Oh, nice. Nice. Uh, so like, that's so cool. Man, what a small world. Yeah. <laughs> oh, because you're in Texas, right? That's all right. We got your home of HEB. What part of Texas? Here in Austin. You like Austin, it? Texas. It's funny because you're seeing this kind of this mass exodus from around the country to here, right? Yeah, I just was out there uh, two months ago looking to relocate. We explored a little bit north, um, like Dallas, Fort Worth area. Mm -hmm. And now we have some friends that just moved out to a place called Plano, which is much. So we live in this like little area called Lakewood Ranch, right? Um, and it's got like a specific style, right? There's a specific density to it. There's a quality to it, right? And we were looking for places that had this similar feel, but just in a different climate. And we did a climate map and we saw that Texas was a large, like a large part of Texas was in the climate that we wanted. And cause we're like in Florida, it's really hot. And we just want like a little, like less hot. <laughs> we don't want cold, cold. Yeah. And we saw that that Texas area matched. And so we, we started exploring and then our friends ended up selling their home and moving out. And they said, Plano is like the Lakewood ranch of, of Texas. We should go check that out. So uh, now that's our next next spot to check out. But you you like Texas? Were you born there? I, I'm I'm wasn't born there, but I grew up there. So in Texas, we care about the distinction a lot. You can't claim to be a Texan unless you were actually born here. Unfortunately, that's right. My uh, my dad's whole family is from Lubbock. Okay, great. That, I like Lubbock. That's the Palo Duro Ranch area up there. Beautiful part of uh, beautiful part of the state. Plano is a good option though. You know, you have more um, corporate headquarters in Plano than I think anywhere else in the country. Oh really? I did not know that. To fact check me on that, but it's either it's either one or two. Yeah. So you stay there though. You mm -hmm. like it? It's a good uh, it's a good place to I would say get things done. If you think about New York City, it's a great place to be inspired. Um, the clock in Austin definitely ticks at half speed. That can be a good thing though for executing. It means it's less distractions, right? If you think about the way I always like to think about cities is you can kind of sum up any great city in the world with a question right? New York's question, when, as soon as you get off the plane at JFK um, or, or Newark is probably, for better or worse, what's your net worth, right? It's, that's kind of how people measure things. You look at the skylines there, you, you, you see Wall Street, it's, it kind of boils down to that a number, right? You go to somewhere like Boston, where you have Harvard and MIT and BU right next to each other. It's like, what are you learning? What do you know? Uh, LA, it's probably, you know, who do you know? Is a question. San Francisco it used to be, what are you doing to change the world? I've, I've rethought that, you know, maybe it's where are you moving to? But uh, uh, Austin's is, is is a bit different, right? It's it's way more about being present. It's way more ephemeral than a ton of different places. And if you go to a coffee shop in any of those cities that I just mentioned, and you listen to the conversations and you kind of try to overhear what people are talking about, it, it gives you a nexus into what those places are about. And in Austin, it's it's way more like sit the Valley, right? Silicon Valley, it's going to be like about some new fundraising or some new startup. In Austin, it's way more. When are we going to the lake later? When are we, you know, going to, uh, you know, maybe hit Sixth Street or something? That's good from a quality of life standpoint, and I think it's a great place to build companies. I would still recommend if you move to Texas, make sure you spend you know other places to get recharged. But it's an equidistant location; you can get either coast in the same amount of time. And they have like all the rockets are there. SpaceX is huge here. Um, I was really fortunate to, uh, to get to invest in SpaceX. I've been following that um, somewhat closely. And I went down to see the Starship launch uh, SN8 two weeks ago, and it was a wild experience. So Elon's here, Oracle's coming here, uh, probably the next big epicenter. And now you're coming here, so that will make it official. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Do you know Firefly yet? Oh, yeah. And those guys. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I got to interview him a couple weeks ago. Super, super cool. They cool. have that, like the turducken thing. They've got the space vehicle in the vehicle and uh, it's supposed to like be able to tow around space stuff like satellites. And I'm really excited uh, to watch them. Their launch is coming up. 
cool. Right. That, we, yeah, hopefully we'll be here to, to see it because one of the, I mean, it's almost a spiritual experience to see a rocket launch. I mean, you see the culmination of humanity, right? And uh, the crazy thing is you have, not only you have SpaceX, but you have Blue Origin here. And Jeff's goal, he said he wants to make kind of the cost of getting involved into space startups, the same as internet startups. And by putting that foundation there with Starlink and, and the other infrastructures, it's going to do just that, right? You're going to be in a situation where you're going to be able to load software payloads up to these satellites and effectively treat them like you might treat apps. Uh, SpaceX, mark my words, I don't have special insight here, but I predict they're going to release something called the space phone and it's gonna compete with the iPhone, all based on the Starlink network. And so you're gonna have a, a whole new kind of slew of innovation around mobile soon. Not special information. <laughs> Not special information, just my prediction. Um, we had some guests on that happened to be like in, the, like in a close group to Elon and they had the Starlink betas already. And cause we wanted to be like, one, do one of the first recorded episodes over Starlink, like be a first Whoa. podcast to do an episode over Starlink. And we're like, we need someone with a Starlink. And so we are combing through our contacts and trying to get someone to agree. Like, even if it's just one-sided, even if just the guest has the Starlink, I still think that would count. That would totally count. There, yeah. I don't know if there's been a podcast done on it yet. That would be, that would maybe tweet Elon and see if that could happen. Right. That please, yeah, we're like contacting their. See, Starlink doesn't have its own PR. Like Starlink falls under its parent company, SpaceX's PR. So we were trying to hunt down their website's very minimal, right? We were trying to hunt down like who's the human behind this project that we could just get a a, a, a yes from their PR team. So we're working on it though. And you kind of take that one step further. It's gonna there's gonna be a whole new round of firsts as are related to this technology. You're not only gonna be able to do the first podcast over Starlink, you could go anywhere on the planet soon, right? You could go to the middle of the Pacific Ocean or Antarctica and have internet that's just as fast or even faster than we might have right now, um, which will be wild. And it'll mean so much to the rest of the world, right? All of these sub-Saharan Africa locations, places in rural India will now have this great equalizer. They will have access to the same type of connectivity that we do. And think about all the businesses and new customers it's going to result for, for our planet. Yeah, I wanted to build, I was asking how much it costs per pound. There, mm -hmm. I think it was like a $10,000 a pound because I wanted to build a small like Raspberry Pi satellite type thing and pay someone and put it up there. And I think, and just so I could sit there with my kids and be like, hey, we're moving a satellite around in space. That would be the best birthday present ever for a kid to say, look, I got you the satellite up there. How, how amazing would that be? Right. And then wow. all of a sudden, like it gets towed away by the Firefly space utility vehicle. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Let me know. If you do that, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll be there to watch it, the live stream for it, for sure. Have you gotten to see a rocket launch in person? Oh, yeah. I got to see, I, I saw a Falcon Heavy launch out of um, Space Coast. And then I, I saw two weeks ago, SN8. Oh, that is so cool. And it's wild. I mean, what you just you realize is, is how difficult of endeavor it is. It's the loudest, brightest thing you've ever seen. And it, it, it gives you so much inspiration and hope for humanity when you, when you realize what we're, what's possible and that we pulled that off. And most likely it's going to get even more impressive, right? We're going to start seeing a launch every other week is what I've heard from Elon on, on Starship. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. I saw around Christmas time, like just a few, few weeks ago, uh, we had our, our Christmas party. We like brought everyone in for it and we had like a dinner. And when we were leaving the dinner, someone was like, oh, I think there's a launch tonight. And they pulled it up and like two minutes later, we just saw the edge of the engine because we're in Florida, right? We just saw it and then it started to curve. So we didn't see it How for cool. long, but we get, yeah, we saw that bright, you know, orange glow in the night going and arcing. And um, I was like, so So I was so pumped up about that. I was like, all right, we're going to go get like an RV trailer thing that we can tow, you know, camper thing. And we are going to go see some space launches. And that's something that I really want to do in life. So, you know, we got the the camper and stuff. That was like the family Christmas thing. And now we're going to uh, go out and, and watch some launches. How cool. Do you, do you think you'll want to go to space someday? Oh, do I want to go? I want to go to space right now. Oh. 
<laughs> well, I, I mean, would totally I think, do it. Let, let me let me maybe rephrase the question. Then. How? Okay, let's say that it's there's a ninety five percent chance that you come back safely. Is that is that high enough, or would you need higher? Oh, what's the quality or what's my risk tolerance? For? Yeah, for something like that. Because I think that's a question we're going to be all faced. We're going to be faced with pretty soon, probably this decade. I don't know. I would need to know somebody that's done it and they'd ha probably have to be somebody that I respect a lot and like have a personal relationship with them. For some reason that tends to be what gets me comfortable with things. Um, statistics are, are great. Like, and it's important, but just knowing some, knowing people that have done it and it's okay. Also, um, I, I I'd probably say easily, if there were, if, if it were equal to the ratio of safe flights, then I would be okay. Like, I'm just coming up with this right now. Sure. My friend. I, I, I don't have, I didn't have this pre-thought. That's interesting to hear. If it were equal to the ratio of airplanes and v or, or car safety, because I take the risk of getting in a car every day, essentially, I take the risk of flying on an airplane. So if the, if it was similar risk profiles, then I would do it without Sure. Caring. I just want to go up. I want to do a couple backflips, eat a meal, pee in a bag, and then come on back. The whole experience. Right? Yeah. The whole experience. Well, the whole suborbital thing, right? That's coming with those those hops. Quicker, quickest way to get anywhere on the planet. That's that's gonna be crazy. You're gonna to get to do that and go somewhere, and it's going to be probably in that risk profile, not initially, but but eventually. So who's doing the hops? Branson's doing the tourism, but a tourism isn't a hop. The hop is like commercial, right? Yeah, I think those are all going to be literal stepping stones, basically, right, to getting to using it as a form of transportation, because nobody wants to just go up and go back down. That's not, I don't think that exciting. That's like an amusement ride. The way that SpaceX is doing it with using it as a form of transportation, where you could go from New York to Shanghai, right, in 40 minutes flat, uh, that's, that's got some utility. You get the whole space experience. You get to pee in the bag, probably if you can't hold it, and then you come back down and you're you're you're, you're somewhere new, right? And you're an astronaut. You crossed the Kármán line. You went up 100 miles, uh, and you could you know commute back to New York that same day. So you're a pilot. What's your threshold for this? I like the way that you think about it, right? We should try to approach something that's as close to zero, right? If you look at aviation, uh, at least commercial aviation crashes in the United States over the last decade. It's like zero. It really is. There was that Southwest passenger that got sucked out of the plane, unfortunately. But in terms of total aircraft losses and, and people dying, it's zero. I don't see why we can't get that way um, with space in the far future and in the near future with, with vehicles. Uh, we've been really close to, at Mutual Mobile, close to kind of the self-driving revolution. We've gotten to see the potential there and, and work with um, executives at Ford, and, and that's going to be how we hit zero: is don't let people drive. They're not good at it. We've explained, we've seen many, many cases, right? You think about COVID nineteen and all of the fatalities that are occurring around the world due to that. It's only slightly higher than how many people die every year in the world due to, due to car accidents and pedestrians. It's a public health crisis, and it's one that we can stop, right? We had warp speed to create this vaccine that's going to hopefully do wonders. Well, with technology, we can stop cars from hitting people. We can stop cars from hitting other cars. And it's going to be something that we see this decade if, if we see the same motivation that we saw for vaccines. Right. If the money is there, and that's why I get excited about things that are backed with business outcomes. Like new technology is exciting, but new technology that has a – like. When I heard a Neuralink, I was like, this is great. But the real great thing is that it's hearing stuff and it's an order of magnitude better than the current brain computer interfaces, meaning it'll hook into a business process and then it'll slowly evolve over time, build cash, improve. And, you know, 10, 20 years out, we have like the dream of the, the, the Neuralink, what it could really do, or there's like an app store on our head type deal. But when things are coming out, like that don't, grasp and they're real strong and hard then i'm like oh that's really cool it's a promising technology but it, it may just not be for today you know exactly and it doesn't need to be this great leap i think to have those types of outcomes in the early days of mutual mobile one of our first initiatives was working with a healthcare company um, to figure out how to reduce medical errors back back then eight times more people were dying in the united states every year due to medical errors than car accidents and all we did was we, we started looking at that workflow. We said, why is this happening? 
most of the medical errors were happening because of something getting lost in translation when you had a paper and pen, um, you know, incumbent technology there. A nurse would write down something incorrectly, either the wrong medication, and most of the time it would be no big deal. But every so often, um, and it adds up, someone would get an order of magnitude more of dosage of a medicine and it would kill them. So we created a solution that just said, let's, let's, let's not have an interim step to getting this into the EMR. Let's just make it so that it goes from your phone, goes from a tablet into the EMR. What would happen? Sure enough, uh, death started going down, medical errors started going away. And that was so simple. That was the low hanging fruit. You start extrapolating this outward, like you were saying, and it's going to have profound, profound positive implications. So is Mutual Mobile like this vehicle that allows you to work across all of these broad sections? Like, tell me, yeah, you guys make apps for companies, HEB, you mentioned healthcare. How do you explain or describe Mutual Mobile to people? Sure, that's a gr great question. Um, so we basically try to figure out how to use emerging technology to help the world's most significant companies drive business outcomes. And that's not always Fortune 100. It's not always Fortune 1000. Sometimes it's new startups that are trying to launch a product. I, you know, I've been very fortunate from my vantage point, I've gotten to talk to literally thousands of CTOs over the years. Many of them have customers, um, many of them are peers. And as a result, I've kind of seen what's worked and what hasn't worked, as is our team. Uh, our president, Pradeep, um, who is doing an amazing job, gets to gets to literally take a diagnostic approach and, and says every day, tries to talk companies out of embracing new emerging technologies, right? Just like a new drug, they can cause more damage. And we feel something akin to the Hippocratic Oath, that, look, first do no harm, right? And so we we take a completely agnostic approach. We don't, um, you know, we don't push any specific technology. When we first start talking with a customer, great example is Google. We worked with Google uh, to build Google Wallet. And this was a product that, you know, you think very high priority, they would want to do it in-house but they realized that they had blind spots as it related to iOS specifically. And we looked and looked at the options there and we realized, look, we should, we should do less here. We should provide that minimum base level functionality before we move into higher areas. And so every type of customer that we work with, we take that same approach. We were really fortunate to get to work with um, Garrett Camp, who was the first CEO of Uber on a, on a separate initiative. And he taught us a, a lesson that was so, so valuable. If you think about the founding story of Uber, we all know, you know, they were in Paris, him and Travis, and they were trying to cross the street at the Arch de Triomphe to get a ride to a taxi, and it was dangerous, and they wanted to, to use an app to call the car. What they, what they didn't, they don't tell you is that for the first six months of Uber, arguably the most valuable app company today, they didn't have an app, they didn't have technology. It was literally text message your location to an operator. That operator will connect you with a vehicle. It was all it was all jazz hands as it related to what was happening behind the scenes that allowed them to figure out what they should build. And so when I look at technology and what Mutual Mobile does, a lot of times it's it's focusing and trying to get our customers to not initially embrace the newest thing, but instead to get the foundational elements right. Because when you do that, you know, great things happen. Um, one of one of the customers that I'm just most thrilled and proud of what we where we did exactly that is a customer called Southwire out of Atlanta. Southwire is your, your prototypical company that isn't, isn't technology back currently. They were running a $5 billion a year wire company on an Excel spreadsheet selling wire, electrical wire. This is the wire probably in your house, or your office. Um, they're, they're number one. And you think about running a $5 billion a year company off of an Excel spreadsheet and how difficult that would be, right? Literally, the spreadsheet would take 15 minutes to load if it loaded before it crashed. Um, then if one thing was wrong on it, one cell was wrong on the spreadsheet, they would end up shipping an order incorrectly and it would cost them $2 million to, to reclaim that. So again, really simple thing that we did. We could have added AR from day one. We could have added uh, you know, voice uh, UI and, and done a, fun, a ton of fun things. But we said, look, let's just do the very, very simple thing first and figure out how to make it so that interface doesn't lead to these expensive $2 million errors. We did that it's generated nearly half a billion dollars in value for their company. And uh, we're working with them today on, on now all of the fun and sexy solutions that do use the new technologies to achieve more, more value. So we're, you'll never hear me trying to advocate that companies jump in head first to the newest new thing. Let's do the easy things first and then, then add on the things that are more exciting. I fully agree. As you're talking, you're just like, I have this highlight reel going through my head of all 
the painful experience I had learning these lessons you're describing. <laughs> Hopefully just once. Hopefully you just had to learn each one once, right? Yeah. Most of them, but the yeah, some of them a couple of times, but or or like a different a different way, you know, because I went from like engineer and in, into business type uh, path, and I, I just found that it was more interesting because I could amplify like as one engineer, I could write so much code, but then if I had a team, and then if I had teams of teams, and then if I I started to understand the business thing about how all of this exists and. Uh, grew a lot, but yeah, to focus on on outcomes as we were talking about earlier. But yeah, just as you're talking, thinking about all the different uh, lessons, it, it, we gravitate. Engineers will will gravitate towards the shiny technology because it's the new, interesting thing. But I was always surprised because I would see a company and they would have like they wouldn't have like a polished logo, right? Or their website wouldn't look great. But I'd find out that they make a hundred million dollars a year. I was like, how is that possible? You know, their, their brand doesn't look awesome and shiny how, and how are they making so much money or their technology isn't great. How do they sell for so much money? And all those, that curiosity to figure those things out drew me just farther and farther into the business world. And then I realized how uh, like value works and currency and how exchange of value works between mm -hmm. people and businesses. And you just have to be of value and then that will get exchanged and then it's about understanding the exchange rates and what services you're providing. And then it's ultimately so weird because it's like incredibly cliche, but it's just about helping people. Right. Cause yeah, that's, that's what we do. And, and, you know, to that point, helping people, I mean, that's, that's what a CTO does is, is ultimately it's probably the classic example of servant leadership to employees. And I feel like out of the entire executive suite, that's probably the most difficult position because they're having to, to really fight wars on two front. one fronts. One front is, is they're the autoimmune system, right? Everybody wants to bring in new technology, try new things. Well, any one of those could lead to a cataclysmic data breach, right? And literally end the company's existence. And so that's gotta be priority number one. Priority number two is you know, how do we use new technology to, to grow the business and accelerate um, our mission? And a lot of times those are at odds with each other, right? And the, the CTO is in many cases stuck in the middle. So I feel like the best type of CTO, you know, maybe what I was just thinking about this morning before I, before we jumped on the call, is it really shouldn't be you know, chief technology officer anymore. It should be maybe chief trying officer or chief testing officer, because that's what their job really entails and doing that testing and that trying in a meaningful way. If you look at the backlog of suggestions that a CTO gets every day, I'm sure that list is just gargantuan, right? And they have to know which one's are worth testing, which ones should get thrown out, which ones are dangerous. Um, I've, you know, and I've, I've had somewhat of a challenge myself and how do you triage things that you should do for your company and for your, your clients' companies? And I came across a really kind of great uh, uh, heuristic to doing that. So I, I'm fortunate, I got to meet Tim Ferriss. I found out he's, he's my neighbor at the build, my building here in Austin, another person who moved, uh, moved here. And I've started diving into some of his teachings and learnings. And he says, look, you know, everybody has so many things on your plate on their plate at any given time we have our to-do list how do we possibly prioritize prioritize and triage what we should do and what what tim says is look try to pick the one thing like a domino that if you push that over all of the others will fall into place or in lieu of that pick the one thing that if that succeeds none of the other things really matter and i've taken that to heart and it makes those types of lists much more manageable when you approach it from that perspective yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of of Tim's uh, and his teaching, his book. One of the th that's like a variation of that has actually seeped into my routine over the past two years, and it's every day we figure out like what's the most important thing, you know, what's the thing that's gonna change everything. Where where's the highlight of my day, right? Like mm -hmm. so today, this podcast is the highlight of my day. So I wake up, oh, well, I look likewise. at my schedule, I've got like all these things, and I'm like, what's the one thing that I have to nail? And then everything else can just be side items around it, like doing some tax stuff this morning or whatever. Everything else is just if it, it's in the background noise. And then there's the one thing that's got to, that is going to be awesome today. So I love that perspective. I think that, that if people just operate with that, it means that you know, most of the workday gets freed up. And perhaps that's why people are being somewhere, so much more productive by working at home, is they're not pulled in a ton of different directions, right? And it, and it just, really clears and amplifies the paths that matter. 
one of the things that's amazed me during the pandemic that we've seen is the level of consolidation, right? I mean, you've just seen so much M&A happening. Um, many of our customers have gotten acquired. Many of them have been doing the acquiring. And the reason is they're not bombarded by these day-to-day -day business tasks. I think it, it says, look, if we really want to hit our growth goals, if we want to serve our customers effectively, effectively M&A is, is, is the strategy. And I think that's great. And it's, I'm certainly an advocate when they're able to do that. One thing that I encourage you know, many of our customers to consider and, and you know, many of the listeners as well is instead of using the M&A uh, tool, which is, is a powerful tool, think about building. In most cases, it's cheaper and more effective to build that capability, that company in-house than it is to go on a buying spree, right? For you know, $100 million, you can build quite a bit in-house and you can probably get something that's a much, much better fit than if you go on a shopping spree. And that's where we really come in. And I think Mutual Mobile is the most effective is we help companies build organizations and technology products that they would otherwise have to buy. A great example of that is we worked with Cox Automotive to create this company called FlexDrive, which was one of the first car sharing automotive programs. It allowed people to effectively have a car delivered to them they could swap it out on a, on a weekly or monthly basis, drive something different. If they were going on a trip and didn't want to pay for it, the car would get picked up and taken away. And it's something that's used you know, widely to this day. It was recently acquired by um, Lyft because it had value to give their drivers vehicles who wouldn't have them otherwise. But that was something that if they had gone out and tried to buy it, it would have probably cost them $500 million. And they were able to work with us and build it for a fraction of that, a rounding error of that. That's amazing. Yeah. When I was looking at your customer list and I was just, I was thinking like, okay, how do these companies decide to use you? Like what's the internal process where they start to evaluate you as a provider uh, and like, where do you come into their life cycle? Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. The way that I've started thinking about it is it's almost like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs for companies or for CTOs, right? At the very baseline, you have, just like with people, physiological needs. If you don't have air, food, or water, nothing else really matters. There's, there's some companies that are dealing with issues that need to be addressed yesterday. And so we can provide a ton of value and that we have a team on the bench that can immediately take care of immediate product needs or maintenance needs and, and, and basically patch the boat. So a lot of our customers initially come to us in emergency situations like that where it's obviously not our preferred way of starting. We rather you know, work with co companies that don't, aren't having to go through that because you know I know it's a difficult place to be. So that's one end. I'd say on the other end, we work with companies that are closer to the self-actualizing area, the ones where they have everything in order, they're ready to do a new product initiative, and they're, they're preemptively realize that the onslaught from Amazon, Google, Facebook is coming, and they want to they wanna prepare for it. You mentioned HEB. HEB uh, customer ours is a fantastic example of, of someone that was ahead of the ahead of the game. They realized that Amazon was going to be out on a tear many years ago, and they've done a fantastic job building products that allowed them to defend from that onslaught. So much of our book of business today, much of the customers that we get to collaborate with, are taking the steps to uh, to remain competitive in this new world where Amazon's at the forefront. And one thing that it's kind of a fun game that I that I like to play is something, you know, give me an industry where Amazon or Google or Facebook isn't going to dominate. It. And it's almost impossible to come up with one. Like you think like you, you think about wild thing, you think about airlines, right? Surely no, but no, right? SpaceX is doing stuff there. Amazon's going to do their own rocket system there. Google's already doing it by democratizing how people buy flights. It's, it's almost impossible. I just saw an article today that Amazon bought some jumbo jets. At, oh, wow. Was it Atlas? I haven't check the news i was wondering which one it was i saw the headline it literally came through today on this newsletter i read and it said amazon buys jumbo jets like they put in a giant order to buy some jumbo jets and i was like "Ooh, that's exciting because you've got amazon then you've got origin who's very actively doing space flight mm -hmm. and then everyone's been I, I read something uh because my my uh, father-in-law it works for ups for like mm -hmm. 30 years and the first thanksgiving conversation i had with him like six years ago is about automation and it's never going to happen. And like, it's too complicated and the truck drivers will never go anywhere. So I continuously feed him updates about, I think like one of the semi trucks completed its first autonomous delivery. <laughs> I have a lot of fun. I asked, 
I also make sure to ship them all their Christmas presents and birthday presents with FedEx. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that's so sweet of you. I'm sure, I'm sure they yeah. love that. <laughs> he loves, he loves it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I've, I actually completely forgot what I was talking about because I love making, having fun with that guy. <laughs> well, you, I mean that, but that, that's, that's important. I think it is, it is relevant to what you're talking about. You're talking about kind of why customers come you know, to us and it's to basically it, a lot of times to fend off competition pre preemptively. If you think about why people spend money and I'd say companies are made of people, right? So it's really the same analogy. It's for one of two reasons. People spend money to um, to mitigate or maybe rather to minimize pain in some way, or it's to maximize happiness or the chance of happiness, right? So a company coming in, maybe it's UPS, right? We haven't worked with UPS yet, but it would be um, around, you know, if we spend these dollars today, will it mean that we avoid losing market share? And that's the minimization of pain, right? And, and that translates to people. Well, if we're able to maintain or increase market share, it means that myself and my coworkers will will get some incentive bonus or our stock price will go up, then the happiness occurs. And so we try to, you know, we don't try to get too philosophical or at mutual mobile, like we don't go super deep, but we realize all the stakeholders that we work with, they're not just trying to hit goals for their company, they're trying to hit goals internally for the, themselves and their team. How can we work backwards, right? If we start at a p &L and we say, look, we wanna drive an order of magnitude increase in earnings, using technology, how can we do that in an effective way? And how can we produce results next quarter as opposed to next decade? Then it becomes more of an optimization problem as opposed to let's just throw things at the wall and see what sticks. As a leader, um, I'm really curious to know this. Like right now, it seems like you've got things balanced and you've got a quality of life and you've got that sort of like figured out, but you, weren't always in the position you are today, right? Like you've grown a lot, you founded the company. It's a lot has happened since 2007 when you first made that application. Did you ever go through the process of like overworking and burnout to figure out this is what you have to do? You know, it's a, that's a wonderful question. The spirit of it is, you know, I, that I get to is, is, you know, should there be a separation between work and, and, and non-work? And I feel like there shouldn't be, right? You should, there's, the reason people need downtime and want downtime is because they're not satisfied with what they're doing for the majority of their time, right? And, and that's that's just a shame. And so when I think about you know what excites me, it's it's getting to be at these these critical revolutions. Early days before the iPhone came out, um, we had smartphones, we had the Windows smartphones, but nobody really got pumped up by those. They had effectively the same features as the early iPhones. They had a web browser, they had a camera, you could text message, they had touch, it wasn't capacitive and such, but they had touch. What happened between the old school smartphone and the iPhone it was really the user interface and the interaction design that changed the game. That's what made it real. And so we have the pre iPhone world and the post iPhone world. And when I think about right now, we're at another revolution. We have the pre pandemic world and the post pandemic world. And in the post pandemic world, digital is the norm. It's, it's going to become unusual and rare to go to stores, brick and mortar stores, to buy goods. And so what, is that, what does that mean? And it's, it's this historical point where you really want to be on the right side of history here. And that's what gets me pumped up is making sure the customers that we work with are very much on the right side of history. So if people are interested and in, what's the first step, did they get a consultation? How does it work? Yeah, I think that, that a lot of times it will start with a consultation. Normally there'll be some kind of pressing matter. Um, you know, companies will be working on some type of internal site or they'll need a VR application or there'll, there'll be some type of hardware product with an IOT initiative that isn't doing what it's supposed to. And they reach out to us and say, hey, do you guys have any expertise on this? And we're happy to jump right in and, and work immediately and fix that issue. Yes, we'd love to have a broader, longer strategic conversation, but we want to address the pain immediately that our customers are having. Kind of like when you walk into an ER with a, you know, with a broken arm, you want the arm fixed. You don't want to start talking about, uh, you know, high cholesterol or anything. Let's 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 figure that out first. Then we can we can jump on and 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 talk about the longer term health thing. So that that's generally how it would work. Um, and we love just having the conversations. So I mean, this stuff it is easy to geek out on. And we've seen just a slew of new people interested in, in these products that are coming. Apple AirTags being one of them. That, that it's going to be a huge game changer. I think it's going to be more significant than uh, people are betting on right now. Even though it's it's kind of the least sexy of the, the new products coming out. Those are the the tags you can place on things to find find where they are? 
Yes, and it seems seems kind of trivial. We, you know, it seems like a uh, tile, right? It seems like Apple's version of tile. We actually have the, the co-founder of Tile works uh, with us at Mutual Mobile, um, Nick Evans, and we've been very fortunate to hear his kind of perspectives on this. I think what makes it different with Apple doing this is it's kind of like the difference between the, the Microsoft smartphone and the Apple iPhone. Apple's doing it in a way that will become ubiquitous. We're going to see this have implications for inventory tracking, right? For luggage on flights, the consumer element is going to be significant, but on the enterprise side, it literally may be the answer to a lot of different connected device problems that people have been struggling to solve for a while. That's interesting because Apple already has all of the sales force and relationships with the enterprise, whereas like a tile would not have that infrastructure in place already. Right. And, and if you think about it, Apple has effectively the world's largest mesh network of these devices. You, you, know, you can tie that into Google and Android too, and you combine those two, you have basically a redundant internet backbone and being able to locate either via triangulation or sonar or whatever, it, it's going to mean that you never lose or look for items. Again, we always know where that package is. If your bike gets stolen, we know where it is. Um, you're starting to get you know, there's talk of other telemetry on these air tags. So version one may be about where the device is, what the device is, but soon we can start adding on things into that array like temperature and motion and, and a whole slew of other things. So you get almost a health profile for all of your, your possessions. You could even attach a value to it and know, you know, what, what your wardrobe is worth, right? And where, 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 if things are still the dry cleaners or not, right? That's crazy because then, then you could that's going to hook into the financial market, right? Yeah. Take out a loan against your assets that are all tagged. That's crazy. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be a Black Mirror episode that ties into that as well, but uh, I suspect it'll be more positive than it will be for, um, you know, for, for, for Black Mirror fodder. What's the Apple heads that you were talking about earlier? Yeah, this is going to be the most significant event since, since the smartphone, since the iPhone. Um, so Apple has broken it into kind of two phases. There's there's two there's two products coming. Uh, but before we go into this, let's just talk about why VR didn't work. I mean, like we all have the Android VR headsets, probably in, in different versions of the Oculus in a closet somewhere. I don't know when the last time you used yours was, but it's been a while um, for me. Um, do you have one? Or do you have? It's be, it's become a home for the dust bunnies, right? Good. They need somewhere, don't they? And it's been similar to us. I mean, we, we've done a lot in VR. We've done, you know, one of the areas where VR is working well in its current day is on training. So we've done things um, for kind of mission critical situations. We got to work with a, um, a defense a company in the defense space. I can't say who it is about how you take spy satellites and you correctly load them onto rockets. It isn't SpaceX. And this was something where people were making mistakes and it was delaying missions and costing a ton of money when you, you know, bend a solar panel or whatever. And so we made a, a training app for how you get these extremely expensive pieces of equipment into the rocket. Um, we've done things with power plants too. How do you train people to be safe in, in situations where the stakes are extremely high? VR today works fine for that. The oldest implication of where VR works really well that we've done some work on recently is within aviation training, training pilots. You don't want a pilot's first flight to be with, a, with passengers in a giant aircraft without that training, right? So you need to use virtual reality to give those experiences in a cost-effective and safe way. So for high stakes problems, it works extremely well. Where VR has fallen flat is in the lower stakes area where you have a lot of fungible substitutes for either going out in the real world or and doing it or, or reading a Wikipedia page or watching a YouTube video. The cost of putting on the VR set is, is burdensome. We have to boot it up, you have to calibrate it. It gets too hot, you need to take it off. So similarly to why the Windows smartphones never really caught on, is where VR is today. The utility isn't worth the headache of, of using it, even in the social sense, right? I mean, it's it would have been a perfect substitute for the pandemic to go in and have entertainment experiences in VR, but it's just the value wasn't there. And so what Apple kind of recognizes the reason is, is the interaction. It is very much that paradigm, right? When you, you don't need to boot up an iPhone, you just turn it on, whereas a Windows smartphone, you would need to boot it up like a computer. And so Apple's bridged this with two key products. We don't know what the names of them are specifically, but one way to think about it is the first one is going to be largely a VR um, parentheses AR product that looks more conventionally like an Oculus headset. And this is going to be having a screen with resolution that you're not supposed to be able to tell you're looking at a screen, which is a pretty big feat. This is going to be a device that you use 
generally at home. You're not going to be wearing it out in public. It will be more for probably designers, enterprise settings, entertainment. Um, it won't be a social experience except for the people that you're at, interacting with through it. It's going to be coming out late 2021. We're going to be seeing developers having access to it is what we're seeing. Um, this will be something that replaces all of the other historical, I think, VR headsets that are out there. Now, that by itself isn't going to bring VR to mainstream or AR to mainstream. What Apple has planned out the subsequent year is, is the glass that everybody's starting to get excited about. We don't know it's going to be called Apple Glass or iGlass or glasses, probably will be. It's everything that Google Glass is not. Um, I was you know, one of the people that had the Google Glass. I wore it to a South by Southwest talk, and I just realized halfway through while I was wearing it how stupid it was and you know, took it off because it, it didn't really provide the utility. It had the same fault that the Windows smartphones have. With Apple's version of that, you know they're going to do it right. They're going to make a product that you know, we can't live without. If you wear glasses or contacts, there's a large percentage chance you're going to be able to have your prescription automatically happen through the glasses using the screens. You won't need to go to an optometrist. You can adjust it. You'll be able to zoom in and zoom out, um, you know, save memories, use the LiDAR in a really effective way. That's going to usher in this whole new revolution of applications and software, very similar to what we saw with the 2009 debut of the App Store. And we're getting all ready for that. We want to be the number one company producing those types of solutions. That's fantastic. I. I would, I would like it to be, I'm like talking to Santa Claus right now. <laughs> I would like it to be. To, hey, what do you want? Let me know. I want it to be, because I thought a lot about this. Like, what would it take for me to be using this stuff regularly? It would need to be like indistinguishable from my sunglasses if it has to be something I put on or more ideally something that just happens in this uh, passive way. Like it just happens right? Like the hollow booth things where you're mm -hmm. looking at it and it's 3D, but you're not wearing anything. It's just the way that they have set the depth up and the technology. It just looks like there's a person standing in that telephone booth box, but they're just not in the room, but it looks like they're in the room, but there's nothing else special that you're, you're wearing. I think that's where we need to get to. There's, there's use cases where people are willing to put up with a bit more of a hassle and, and, and knowing that you wear it. We built this application for doctors with Google Glass called Pristine that allowed them during surgical procedures to have the key diagnostics and patient telemetry up on the Google Glass like a HUD and that they could record the procedure. And that provided utility for them and for training. The average person though doesn't have that type of mission critical situation. You don't really need to see your Twitter feed you know, while, you're, while you're driving. You probably should be paying attention to other cars and, and, and you know, maybe what's on the radio, but once the cost of it, and by cost, I don't mean what you pay for it, but like what you were saying, it's the, it feels like sunglasses get so low that you might as well. That's, that will be the moment that everybody embraces it. And it's, a, and it's the pathway to Neuralink, right? These devices are getting more and more intimate, right? We're already having the AirPods in our ears and we're going to put something on our face. We have our watch that we wear almost around the clock now for sleep measuring and sleep tracking. Um, the next logical step is to embed them under the skin. And once that happens, um, we are be computers, right? The line will start to blur and it will give rise to just an unimaginable, I think, positive outcomes for humanity from not just from an accessibility standpoint, but also from a quality of life standpoint too. Yeah. I, when I was thinking of adoption, what was in my head was like people wearing them constantly, like casually, like you see people out in public wearing them. I think there would need to be like sunglasses style or... Um, th that's what, that's the, uh, context that was in my head. Cause I realized I <laughs> gave mm. a whole thought and, like without setting it up at all. Yeah. I, I was just imagining like when I would be in a crowd, who knows if I ever will be again, but <laughs> when I'll be in a crowd and there will be a bunch of people having adopted it. Now it would need to be really light and simple, like the sunglasses. Um, but yeah, you know, you're, you're exactly right. And the company to do that, I mean, I think that Apple is going to be one of the major players here, but it's not enough just for the idea of that. Like you think about Kodak. Kodak had the patent on the digital camera, and now they're bankrupt, right? They had the, one of the most significant patents of the 21st century, yet that didn't help them. They tried to, to squash it internally because they realized it would cannibalize film sales, whereas you had new companies, smartphone companies, Apple, Google, others embrace that and give it away for free, and that's what led to 
these, these huge business ideas. So I think we're going to have that same thing happen. The eyeglass industry in the United States, $110 billion industry. All right, that's actually the world. Watches were only $8 billion, so over an order of magnitude bigger. What we see is very, very important, you know, as important as what we hear. This is going to become, I think, the new UI for people. You won't need your phone if you, got your, if you have your glasses. And the way that we interact with technology, um, the way that we interact with the world is going to cross this Rubicon where we're not going to go back to handsets. And the way to get ahead, I think, is to start thinking about what types of products, ideas, solutions we should build now before it launches. Because you can be first now. That's what's crazy about this. It's like, imagine, I always like to ask the question, you know, if you could go back in time and 20 years and you knew everything that you knew now, what would you do if your goal was just to say, to have a significant impact on the world and you couldn't change geopolitical events? So let's say, you know, you can't stop September 11th or a pandemic, you know, what, what, would, what, would, what would you do? Well, if we're talking about like, and no speculating on wise. stocks, yeah, no, no derivatives or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, because I was gonna, I was gonna buy some Bitcoin. Um, but the other thing I might do is, you know, register Facebook.com and write a yeah. short letter to Mark that I want to be business partners. I love that idea. I mean, that that's a really credible answer. The the man behind the man that buying up domain names could be a fascinating way to do that, and and you would literally become, you know definitely a billionaire, maybe a trillionaire by doing things like that. Well, the crazy thing is we have that opportunity again. We're getting it. We have, you know, free iPhone. We can't go back free iPhone, but we can go back free Apple Glass. And there's going to be certain inevitability, certain things that we know for sure, product ideas that are going to emerge, companies that are going to start as a result of these two products, the headset and the glasses that Apple are making. And if you start thinking about them right now, and you even start building some of the products, the glasses APK is going to be out um, very, very soon. So you're going to be able to start you know, producing these on a simulator probably in six months. If we start now, you can, you can have that time machine and do those types of ideas. You may not know the domain name, but you can come up with the product idea. You're being prepared because we know it's going to happen. It's like what ha the innovation cycles or the cycles of life are speeding up like in mm -hmm. our lifetime, it's, it's getting faster and faster. And so we can see what it's like for the iPhone to come out and then expand over a decade. And then we can better understand the time frame for the next new technologies and we can position ourselves. Plus, I mean, I've been, I feel like every year I get older, I'm like, I've been waiting for this my whole life. Yeah. Right. When I was, if you could have talked to me when I was 13, man, if I wanted to be 30, you know, in my thirties so bad, because I wanted to have the, the ability to, just something changes when you get older, you have more ability to create change. Totally. And, and, and part of it's situational, right? I mean, yes, yes, you know, you know more and everything, but also the frequency I think you're alluding to of these new inventions is, is increasing, right? We used to get a significant major invention, maybe every 500 years in the early days of humanity. I don't know how much time transpired between the fire and the wheel, or if it was the other way, but probably fire came first. Then the wheel, right? And that was probably a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years. And then it, then we got what the printing press, the then the radio, the television, then you know satellites, internet, computer, iPhone. Like now we're getting a five hundred year innovation every like two to three months. It seems it seems like that's the cadence. And so you just pick one of these, and you add it into your company, and it's going to have a big result. And the, you know the insidious thing though is that if you just kind of wait and see. Other companies will start and, and you know, they will take your business as a result of it. So I think that's, that's what people need to be mindful of, not just the opportunity, but also the risk without putting too much FUD out there that this new technology products create if, if you're not aware how it can help you. That's why I almost, almost exclusively invest in companies where their founder is still there. That's smart. Because I see what happens when it just becomes run by a board or it, they just lose their innovation and die off because mm -hmm. everyone's scared and trying to manage by degree and no one's having any vision or pulling the people together and then people mentally check out and start taking a paycheck instead of you know living their passion, even within the organization. But when you have that spark still at the company, those are the companies that continue to grow and will you know overcome new challenges and do great things. Totally. And we mentioned Kodak, you know, being one company that's come to that Blockbuster is another, right? That was a company that had the chance to buy Netflix. They understood the opportunity. They had more than enough resources to go out, go out and build their own internal Netflix. And yet it killed them in a decade. 
Well, it's because their executive team was having so much success and in love with basically being real estate agents. Yeah, it was moral hazard, probably at its finest, right? They were, they were, they were, they were focusing on the wrong things. They were focusing on the, 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 the day to day rather than the, the year to year. And it's something that you see a lot of, I think, companies mistaking every day. And one of the reasons why, out of all of the roles at a company, I don't think you can outsource the CTO. I mean, that's the most dangerous role to outsource. You see companies outsource the CFO, CMO, even you know, private equity shops. Sometimes the CEO. But the CTO is making these types of decisions that you really want skin in the game because the company will be forced to live with the decisions made for the rest of its existence. And if they're the wrong decisions, it might be a very short existence. Um, so you really want, I think, a CTO that remains at the company for perpetually is probably the best way to say it. Yes, there should be a succession plan, but you don't want to be switching that, that person every few years. You want someone that you can, you can keep for good. Right. Or have them groom someone up and move to like a board advisor position, but you want to keep them around. <laughs> yeah, you do want to keep them around and you want to make sure that like, if it's, if, if they make the wrong decision, it should affect them personally. And that's one of the things that we always try to do is we try to have skin in the games. When we work with customers, the most fun relationships, yes, you know, we, we definitely do time materials, contracts, and those types of SSWs. The ones that get me excited and the ones that have been really successful for us, we did one with Disney like this, is where we have skin in the game where it's this nonlinear engagement that if we're able to produce more revenue for a given client, we'll share in that. And that way it means that both companies are really well aligned to be able to produce a result. And it's not essential, but at least it means that everybody's on the same page and people respond to incentives and companies are made of people. So you might as well get those incentives, right? Um, just started a new book. I don't know. I, one of my goals for 2021 20, is to read, at least a book a week. And so uh -huh. I'm, I'm on track so far week one. Um, but the book is called algorithms to live by. And it's uh, this book written by two computer scientists and the names, their names elude me right now. But it basically says like, let's look at optimization problems within computer science, and try to apply them to our own life and our own psychology. Uh, and it's already been just immensely, I think, relevant to only about a third of the way through, but I, you know, about halfway. And I have one more day to keep that goal. Um, highly recommend that book. That is amazing. Yeah, no, I've actually, you're not the first person to recommend that book. I'll take a look at it. Um, I, I just found out today that we're having this uh, author, uh, Riz Verk, and he's like the founder of you know, different groups at MIT, like the MIT Play Lab and stuff. And then he wrote The Simulation Hypothesis. Oh, yeah. So I'm pumped to talk to him. I want to get really weird with that guy. Right? <laughs> do, you, do you think we're in a simulation? I think the argument for the probability that we're in a simulation is a very interesting argument. Mm -hmm. yeah. The base reality argument, right? I think you're spot Sorry. on. Yeah. No, I think you're spot on. Dude, I like you. I'm, I'm really excited. All right. So people want to find out more about Mutual Mobile if they're interested in getting a quote. Uh, speaking to your sales team, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, the, the best way is to just go to mutualmobile.com or email me at john, J-O-H-N, at mutualmobile.com. And we'd love just talking about emerging tech and how it can help your business. Uh, let's just have the conversation and see, and see what we can do together.